Good morning, and Good morning. welcome to the Seed and Land Exchange. It, have all, all of you been to this event before? No? Oh, you're in for a treat. It's a pretty wonderful community event, and you definitely have to, when you come out of the workshop, check out all the seed tables and see what people have to offer. And, and then next year, after learning a little bit about seed saving, you can be bringing some stuff to share back with people. That's pretty cool. My name is Jared Zeistro. I work for a nonprofit organization called Organic Seed Alliance. We work with farmers and with seed companies and with universities and with others to try and increase the diversity, the quality, the quantity of seed that uh, suits organic agriculture and generally sustainable agriculture. So we do a lot of education, we do research into developing new varieties that are specifically adapted to organic agriculture. I live here in Arcata, but we're a national organization. Our home base is up in Washington State. We have someone out in Montana. We work all around the country. And uh, I do have a number of local projects going on too, though. We're working on uh, developing some new varieties of sweet corn in conjunction with the College of the Redwoods and working on finding uh, good varieties of heirloom wheats that grow well here, uh, working on um, a number of different crops, working with a, a quinoa grower in the area to try and improve the varieties of quinoa that he's producing. And so if you're ever interested in coming out and seeing what we're doing in the field or being part of it, I've got a table out there uh, in the main room that you can sign up. Uh, and if you put your email down, I'll let you know when some events are happening uh, throughout the summer. But today we're just going to be going over some of the basics of how you save seed. And the first thing to think about is why why save seed? We can always just go to the garden center or um, look through a seed catalog and, and buy seed. Why would you want to bother saving your own seed? What, what do you all think? What are some reasons you might be interested in saving your own seed? Well, you know, they would grow locally if they're local. That's right, yeah. Yep, yeah, the fact that you, you know where they're grown, um, you know that hopefully they're somewhat adapted and, and able to grow in your area. You also know that if you grew them yourself, they're probably grown more or less organically. You know, they, they weren't grown in, in China um, in, you know, through some maybe undesirable labor practices. Um, you have a much better idea of yeah, what, what the source of your seed is um, because seed is really mysterious. It can get shipped from anywhere in the world to anywhere else in the world. And even if it has a really pretty looking groovy packet, um, you know, that it's been put into doesn't necessarily mean that that seed was grown in a great way. Yeah. And you can buy really old seeds and not even know it. Right. And yeah. For me, it's to save money. On Social Security, save money. I love yeah. that I can just take a handful of garlic, throw it out, and then make beautiful flowers. And love yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can save money. You don't have to feel like you have to you know, worry about every single seed that you plant. You can sow your seed heavier than you would have otherwise. Um, and that's really nice kind of freedom to yeah, not have to worry as much. You know, seed all of a sudden becomes less, um, yeah, but you can be much more free with the seed that, you, that you're sowing. Um, some of the other reasons um, that kind of go along with the, what you were talking about as far as if you save seed, you have a feeling like this was grown locally and adapted locally. Well, every time, and we're going to go over this in the talk, every time you save seed, if you're doing a good job of saving seed, you have an opportunity basically to kind of further adapt that variety for your particular growing conditions, for your environment, for your needs, and really improve it over time into maybe something better than if you were to buy um, somebody else's variety. So there's this opportunity for adaptation. Um, some of the other reasons include just an opportunity for to learn because it's really neat to see the full life cycle of the plants. To not just see, you know, so often when you're growing vegetables, you're harvesting something that's really not fully mature. It's still just in its juvenile stage and it has this whole other part of its life where it um, bolts and sends up flowers and then those flowers get pollinated and mature and produce seed and it's really an incredible process to watch and to be part of. Um, 
there's a oftentimes people get started saving seed um, because they have a particular variety that they um, somehow came across, um, you know, were maybe given by someone um, or have, um, uh, you know, was, was something maybe they got from a seed catalog but is no longer offered. And so it's this sense of preservation of like, well, if you don't save the seed of it, it's not going to be out there. And that's, that's often a really strong motivation and um, seems like it can snowball as, as you begin saving seed, you begin finding more and more seeds that you want to steward. Yeah. Really? And you can make plants out of them because I found a book called Don't Throw It, Grow It. And it has all these really cool plants, including kiwi and loquat, that you take your seeds. Well, they all have to be organic. And you can actually make a beautiful plant, um, which I'm going to do with the peanut. You have to get organic peanuts, and you can make a plant. Right. Yep. Yep. Taste. Yeah. Is, yeah, I don't see it there, but taste if you can grow the kind that you like the way it tastes. And like in hot peppers and stuff, you can save seed from, if you want them hotter, or if you don't want them as hot, you can select and save them for your own taste. Yeah, yeah, often what you learn as you begin to save seeds is that even within a particular variety, not all the plants are the same. You know, some, are, some might be larger, some might be smaller, some might have, you know, might be spicier, some might be less spicy, you know, differences in colors, and by saving seeds from the plants that you like, you will slowly kind of shift that variety in that direction, and that's really fun. So, what we're going to talk about, now that you have some of the sense of what some of the reasons you might save seed, we're just going to go over a few of the basics here. Really, there's a huge depth to learn about seed saving, and I'm not going to cover it all in the next 40 minutes by any means, but I would say that, you know, on one hand it's really easy, and on one hand it's, it's, it's as simple as, as, as growing the plants and, and collecting the seed, and <coughs> anyone can do it, and it's really fun and enjoyable, um, but there are, as you get into it, there's also this huge opportunity to get better at it and learn all of the specific tricks for doing the best job you can. And it really comes down to different species uh, require slightly different techniques. And, and that's what uh, you're really going to end up learning as you get into this. And I'm not going to so much talk about this on a species by species basis. I'm not going to necessarily tell you how to save, you know, lettuce versus kale versus summer squash, you know, versus quinoa. Um, what I would say is uh, at Organic Seed Alliance, we have a slew of free publications, including one that's our seed saving, our general seed saving guide. You can check it out at our table there in the main room, and you can download that for free from our website, seedalliance.org, and it covers a pretty wide range of common garden crops and some of the basic um, parameters for how to save seed from those different varieties and different species. What I am going to talk about today is more of really giving you the, the, the tools and the language so that you can kind of speak seed saving. So when people talk about, oh, well, this is a crosser, or, you know, this is a biennial, or, um, you know, this is a um, dioecious plant, um, or this, you do this one wet seed, you know, you clean this one, you know, using the wet seed process. You know what those words mean and you can apply them to the particular crop that you're, you're working with. So that's why I'm gonna go over some of the basic terminology, understanding the different flower and seed types, um, talk a little bit about life cycle and mating strategies, and, and go over, and again, in kind of the general terms, how you might, what you might do during harvest and cleaning and storing. So what I wanna show you here is, this is just a really generic flower, and as you know, flowers come in a huge range of different sizes and shapes and structures. Um, but some of the things that you might find on the flower, obviously you'll find petals, uh, typically to uh, attract insects in the case of really showy petals, or sometimes the petals really um, aren't very showy if there's no need to attract insects. Um, but with inside of those petals, you might find a couple different things. And what you'll find is that um, Plants have male parts and they have female parts on their, in their flowers. 
and the male parts here are known as stamen. And up at the top of the stamen here are these things called the anthers, and this is where all the pollen is. So, you know, when you see a bee covered in pollen, it's because they're brushing up against the stamen here, um, or up against the anther at the, the end of the stamen. And what will happen in order for a plant to make seed is a journey has to occur. A journey where the pollen has to leave these anthers and somehow make it over to here. And over, this is the female part of a flower, known as, uh, the whole thing is known as the pistil. And up on top here is the stigma. This is where the, the pollen will ultimately land. And so this journey can be really short. Um, it can just be within a single flower, just as, you know, as short as this. Um, or it can be a really, really long journey where this pollen either gets carried on the wind or by insects until it eventually finds its way to another flower and lands here. And then the pollen, pollen's kind of like a little plant. It's almost like little seeds of its own. It's, it's actually kind of like a second, separate cycle of the, the plant's life cycle. And what will happen is pollen, just like a little seed, it actually germinates. And it will germinate here on the stigma and it'll grow what's known as a pollen tube, this long tube that grows down through this part, um, which is known as the style, all the way down here to where actually there are eggs, just like you know in humans uh, or in animals, there are eggs here in the ovary of the flower. And so the pollen will grow these tubes down and then they'll fertilize those eggs and that will ultimately develop into seed. So as a seed saver, what do you need to know? Why does this matter? Well, there's two things to keep in mind. The first is that you're really responsible for making sure that the pollen has a successful journey, has, is able to successfully make its way from here to there or from here you know, through the wind to you know, another flower. And in order for that to happen, some plants are able to pollinate themselves and so the journey can be really short. Some require insects and it may be a specific type of insect. It might be a fly or a, um, or a bee um, or a specific kind of wasp that, that carries that pollen from there to there or it might be the wind that carries it. And during that journey, the pollen um, is vulnerable. Um, it, it can't necessarily get too cold, it can't get too hot, it can't dry out too much. Um, otherwise, it might die on that journey before it's able to germinate and help you make seeds. And so what you want to learn about the seeds that you're growing is you want to know what kind of conditions those plants like during what we call pollination time, which is when the flowers are fully mature and they open and pollen is starting to flow out of them. Um, often, it's similar to kind of ideal conditions for that plant. So if you think about a plant that's more of a cool weather plant, something like spinach, say, it prefers it to be pretty cool during pollination. It prefers that the temperatures really aren't much over 70 degrees when it's flowering. Um, something that's uh, more of a hot weather plant, something like tomatoes, peppers, um, will prefer it to be a little warmer. Um, Likewise, you want to make sure that it's, uh, you know, it's not raining um, if the plant requires, say, uh, bees to carry it because the bees won't be flying during rain. Not that you have a lot of choice there, but this is something to kind of be aware of when you're thinking about, when should I plant this so that um, it flowers at the right time of year so that I get good pollinations? Or, you know, what does it need? Does it need bees? Am I in a place where I have bees? Can I borrow a friend's hives during pollination to make sure that you get lots of good pollination, fertilization, and ultimately what we call good seed set. In other words, a lot of seeds um, that end up actually growing in every flower. The other little bit of plant anatomy here that I want to show you is I want to take a look inside of seeds. And really what I want to show you here is that in seeds, when you look at them, there's two primary things that are in all seeds. You have, um, you have kind of this embryo, which is 
essentially kind of the, the plant to be. You know, a lot of this, it has a lot of what will be the plant already in miniature inside of the seed. It has the first leaves. It has the beginning of a root um, already all clustered in there. But then the bulk of the seed, what makes up the bulk of this seed? Exactly. It's food. It's, it's stored energy. And so the way I think about seeds really is they're like little um, escape pods or life rafts that the plant sends out from one generation off into the future so that way it can continue and survive and grow some point in the future. And so, you know, you want to make sure that those life rafts are well provisioned with lots of food. And so what that means as a seed grower is you want to make sure that when you're harvesting the seeds, you're providing conditions where you can get nice, mature, full seeds, and you want to be able to wait. You want to be patient and make sure that those seeds have the time to fully mature and develop so that way there's as much food in them as possible before you harvest that seed. So that's a little bit of looking inside the flowers and inside the seeds. Another, but to give you some terminology and some of the lingo that seed savers use when they're talking, um, there's another um, kind of broader classification, one way we divide up different kinds of plants when we're talking about seed saving is based on how the flowers are arranged on the plants. So not all, obviously we know that not all flowers look just like this, but in fact, not all flowers even have both male and female parts on the flowers. So some do, and we call those perfect flowers. Those are flowers like in these brassicas here, you know, so I don't know if this might be a, you know, we can say this is a kale flower. I'm not entirely sure what species it is, but it's got those bright yellow um, brassica oleracea type of flowers on it. Um, and, these, and these flowers, they have both female and male parts on them, and they, so we call them perfect flowers. But we also have flowers where it either has only a male, male parts or female parts. And so we have plants that we call monoecious that have male flowers and separate female flowers. So classic example of this would be a lot of the squashes. Um, things in the squash family will have um, female flowers like this. You can see this would be, you know, develop into a summer squash at some point. Um, and this, so this is what's called the ovary. Um, where the seeds will ultimately develop in. But then there's also male flowers that just have the, um, just have the stamens, just as, you know, is where the pollen is. And so in this case, you know, in the case of perfect flowers like this, the journey might be fairly short between where the pollen travels. You know, in this case, it's going to have to travel from a different flower uh, to this female flower. It's going to have to travel from a male flower to the female flower. Um, and the plants do this because Oftentimes plants, some plants, and we're going to talk about this more in a second, but some plants want to encourage cross-pollinating. They, they, they don't want to just pollinate themselves. They want to cross with a different plant. They want to send their pollen to a different plant, and they want pollen to be coming from a different plant to make their seed. And so one of the ways they do it is they say, okay, well, you know, if we make sure, you know, if, if the male flower is over here and the female flower is over here, well, some of this male pollen maybe will actually still, you know, pollinate the same plant. But some of it might also go over to this other plant over here. And so by separating them, they increase that chance that they might cross with other plants. Um, the most extreme example of plants trying to separate their male from female flowers in order to encourage this kind of crossing between plants is what we call dioecious plants. Um, and so these are plants where they're essentially male plants and female plants. So that a male plant has all male flowers and a female plant has all female flowers. So this is a picture here of spinach. Spinach is an example. Um, living here in Humboldt County, most of us know probably that pot is an example. In marijuana has male plants, female plants. Um, there are relatively few examples like this. There's a lot of tree species too where there's male you know, male trees and female trees, and if you, unless you have both, you're not going to have successful um, pollination. So being aware of this, you know, when you have a plant where you only have male or female um, 
you know, you have either males or female flowers on that plant it means that you're going to need to make sure that you have both of those if you want to make sure have successful pollination and seed set. So that's one way that people kind of divvy up the world of, of plants when they're thinking about seed saving. Another way is based on their life cycle. So some plants will grow from seed all the way to seed again and, and to produce seed all in one year. And these are called annual plants. So you'll be you know, starting potentially in the spring or sometimes in our climate you might start in the fall and let it overwinter. Um, but basically it will grow from a seed into a vegetative plant um, and then it will form a flower stalk and flowers will, um, flowers will open and get pollinated and seed will form all in the course of you know, within a 12 month cycle or less. Um, oftentimes what you might realize is that some plants um, just because they can produce seed in this course of a year you may find that it doesn't produce seed for you if in, in your season so um, for example some lettuces you know when we think about say like things like iceberg types crisp head types um, even though they're theoretically an annual plant they're very, very, very slow to actually what we call bolt or um, send up that seed stock. And so you might actually need to be starting these the previous year just in order, be, in order to have them fully mature within in your window you know, before the fall rains come um, the subsequent year. But a lot of these are basically kind of fit within this category of going from seed to seed in one year and, and are relatively straightforward. The other strategy, um, and, and I wanted to, is what we call uh, biennials. And these are plants that take two years, more or less, to produce seed. And the way that they work is the first year, they're typically growing vegetatively, meaning that they, they're not sending up any reproductive structures, they're not flowering. Um, and they're storing up their energy somehow that first year. So a lot of the crops that we think of in terms of root crops or bulb crops um, are biennials, you know, things like carrots or beets or onions, um, parsnip, you know, also some of these really fleshy, um, you know, heading plants like a lot of the cabbages, um, Swiss chard, um, all of these, what they do is that first year they grow vegetatively and they store the energy that they've been collecting from the sun in something you know, either in a root or a bowl. And then they're able to use that energy to survive over the winter. And then the next year, when spring comes around, they use some of that energy they've been storing in their root or in their bowl and regrow and collect more energy when they begin photosynthesizing again the next year and use up essentially two years worth of stored energy to produce a really bumper big crop of seed in their second year. So the second year they actually, you know, they switch over from just being vegetative to then flowering and setting seed. The thing that you need to know about with these biennials is that most of them, um, you know, they don't carry, they don't have watches on their hands or, you know, a clock on their cell phone. They don't, you know, the way that they know, how do they know that it's you know, winter is over, that the they're done with their first year and spring has returned and now it's time to start growing uh, flower stalk and flowering. Um, most of them know through this process called vernalization. And vernalization is essentially where the plants will sense how much, how long it's been cold out. And they will um, have kind of these internal clocks that um, sense, okay, how many hours has it been cold for. And if it's been cold for long enough, then they're like, okay, this is winter. This isn't just some kind of you know cold snap in the fall or in the spring. This is really winter. And when it warms up again, then it's going to be spring. It's going to be time to flower. And so that vernalization period, the amount of time that most of these crops require um, in terms of the, the, the length of time that needs to be cold before they think it's winter and it's time to flop and when it warms up, it'll be time to flower. It's typically somewhere around eight or 10 weeks of temperatures that are below 50 degrees. And this is a cumulative number. So that means that if you're getting um, winter weather where the nights are below 50, you know, half the day, 
is below 50 degrees, but the days are warmer, then you know, it'd be more like 16 to 20 weeks of, of, of cold nights. Does that make sense? The, um, in our climate, most of these can be just grown in the ground. You can, you can plant them the next year and let them survive in the ground over winter and then flower the next year. In some climates that are either too cold um, and will kill the plants or too warm where they don't get this fertilization, people might dig them up and store them you know, in their fridge or root cell or something like that. If you happen to have a situation where you're worried that rats or gophers or something like that's gonna eat all your roots, if you leave them in your garden over the winter, you can do that as well. You can dig them up and store them in the fridge or root cellar or something like that. And the really nice thing about digging these up is then you have a chance to actually look and see like, oh, I like how this carrot looks. Oh, I don't like how that one looks. I'm gonna not save seed from that carrot and get rid of it. So that's a really good reason to dig the plants up. And you can, even if you decide to just let them stay in the ground over the winter, it still often might make sense for you to dig them up in the fall, look at them all, get rid of the ones that you don't like how they look, and then just go ahead and replant them right then. So one thing to keep in mind here is um, when we're thinking about this fertilization, um, and it's not as important here really, maybe I won't mention it, um, though it's tempting to. If you live in a place that's warmer, sometimes you can, there's a risk of, of um, kind of messing up your variety. If you, if, if you live in a place that really only got a couple of weeks of cold weather in the winter time, and then in the springtime what happened was you know, oh, well, a lot of the plants, it turns out, you know, it wasn't cold enough over the winter. A lot of them didn't actually fertilize and aren't, aren't flowering. But a few of the plants do. A few of the plants do flower and make seed. And you're like, well, great, now at least I've got some seed, even though, you know, just it's only a handful of my plants out of uh, most of these. Um, what you would, the mistake that you're making, if you save seed that will, from a plant that can make seed with very little fertilization, um, you're undoing a lot of work that plant breeders have done to prevent plants from bolting prematurely. So, you know, carrots is a classic example. You know, some people that grow carrots and save seed from in, in areas where they don't get a lot of this fertilization, what can happen over time is then you take the, that carrot seed and you plant it somewhere um, that has cold springs and you get a little quick you know, uh, you know, a, a week cold snap in the spring and all of a sudden all your little teeny tiny carrot seedlings are all bolting because they said, hey, that's, that's long enough winter for me. You know, I can get by with two weeks of cold and then they get springtime. And so you've accidentally selected for things that bolt really quickly. If you don't um, make sure that everything gets this long fertilization period and not save seed from stuff that is able to bolt with the shorter fertilization. So this, so I've, I've, I've told you a little bit about how, how flowers and, and, and seeds work, a little bit about the different life cycles, um, but you know, all that's interesting and, and important, but if there's, there's a couple of things that I really want you to walk away from this talk today with, and one of them is this idea as stewards of seed, as savers of seed, you are really responsible for how that variety works, um, how well it, whether you're improving it and making it better or whether you're making it worse. Um, and so that takes some thought in terms of choosing which varieties, you know, which plants in your, in your garden look the best and only saving seed from those. Um, and it also takes some work in terms of making sure that you have, are saving seed from enough plants and that those seeds aren't the result of accidental crosses between something else that you didn't want them to cross with. And so what I'm going to be talking about now is related to those two topics of how do you, how many plants do you need to save seed from and how do you keep the plants from, you know, accidentally crossing with, you know, with things you don't want it to cross with. So a lot of this is based on this concept of are we working with a plant that we would call an inbreeding plant, or are we working with a plant that would be an outbreeding plant? There's a lot of different words for this same thing. Some people call them self-pollinating plants versus cross-pollinating plants, or selfers versus crossers. Um, essentially, what this is, is that some plants 
um, primarily self-pollinate, meaning you know all of the, the pollen that they're getting on a given flower um, is going back onto that same flower and pollinating it. Some plants are primarily cross-pollinating, where most of the time the seeds that are being made are the result of one plant crossing, sending pollen to another plant. And we divide kind of, when we talk about seed saving, it's often people really kind of just divide it into halves and say, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a selfer, or that's an inbreeder, you know, versus, oh, that's a, that's a crosser or an outbreeder. But really it's a spectrum. And the spectrum, you know, goes from things that are very highly self-pollinating where almost all the time all the seeds are being produced as the result of a, a self-pollination um, to, you know, on up through kind of things that do a little bit of both. You know, sometimes they cross between plants, sometimes they pollinate themselves um, to ones that are almost always crossing between plants. And what we find is that these, whether something is more cross-pollinating or something is more self-pollinating affects these two really important concepts. It affects the isolation distance that we need and it affects the population size that we need. And I'm going to define those two terms. So isolation distance is basically how far do you need to, how far does your seed crop, you know, your, your garden, um, the, the plants that you're saving seed from in your garden need to be from other flowering plants of the same species. And this is really important. This is something that you'll find when you get into seed saving is you want to learn your, your Latin or your Greek. You want to learn the scientific names for the plants that you're saving seed of. Because, for example, um, a pumpkin um, can be, you know, there are, um, or let's say a squash. Squash can be either, you can, grow four, you can grow squash in your garden. You can grow four different squash in your garden. Well, in this area, you can grow three different squash in your garden and none of them will cross to, together because you can grow a squash like a, uh, let's say, uh, an acorn squash, which is Cucurbita papo as a species, and you can grow a uh, you know, kabocha squash, um, you know, which is Cucurbita maxima, and you can grow a butternut, which is Cucurbita moshata, and those are all different species and they won't cross. But you could also be like, well, I'm going to grow, I'm going to grow, you know, three different things. I'm going to grow my, you know, I'm going to grow a pumpkin, I'm going to grow a gourd, and I'm going to grow a zucchini, and, you know, I should be good to go. Those are all different. Well, you can, some, zucchinis are cucurbita papo, as are, like I said, acorn squashes, as are, like, jack-o'-lantern type pumpkins, as are those, like, ornamental warty gourds that you see around Halloween. Those are all the same species, and they will all cross with each other grow them side by side. So it becomes really important to learn not just the common name of the, of the thing that you're growing, but learn the scientific name as well. Because that will tell you if something shares, if they're the same species, if they share the same scientific name, and they're within this isolation distance, if they're closer than, you know, for example, squash, you know, somewhere a mile or less, um, there's a chance that they'll cross-pollinate. What I'm going to talk about with this range is that there's this, it's really important that this is not, this isn't cut and dry. And, and, and Bill here, who's a professional seed grower, can argue with me about all of these numbers, I'm sure, because what we find is that it depends. Um, so it depends, um, uh, if, it, it depends on a couple different things, how big this isolation distance has to be. Of course, as I mentioned, it depends on what species you're talking about and whether how self-pollinating versus how cross-pollinating it is. It also depends on how big a patch you're growing. So if you're growing, you know, a few dozen plants of, um, you know, a few dozen peppers, and your neighbor, you know, who's, you know, 600 feet away from you is also growing a few dozen peppers, well, it's not that many pepper plants. There's not that much pollen being carried around in the air by bees necessarily. Um, but if you're growing an acre you know, of peppers and your neighbor's also growing an acre, well then there's a lot of pollen and a lot of bees are carrying that stuff and it increases the chance that there will be crossing. So the size of the patch matters. Um, the other thing 
that matters is are there some sort of barriers that are either stopping the wind from carrying the pollen or stopping the bees from getting from place to place? Right, so are there trees or buildings or something that's sort of slowing down, you know, in between where, you know, one variety and the different variety of the same species are growing? Well, that will let you decrease this isolation distance. It will let you, you know, grow plants closer to each other without worrying about them crossing. And then the other thing is really kind of just a risk thing, which is that how much do you worry about there being a cross? You know, if it's just like, well, I'm growing some cilantro and so is my neighbor, and if the, my cilantro and my neighbor's cilantro cross together, like, it'll probably still just look like cilantro. And frankly, this is actually how the professional commercial seed industry does things. When they decide, they'll, 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 they'll meet up um, in big seed growing areas they'll meet up at county you know the local county extension and say i'm growing this thing here and okay well no one else can grow you know i'm growing um red beets here well beets and swiss chard are actually the same species and they will cross together and if you cross um if you're growing red beets and some um swiss chard crosses into your beets it's going to not look like a beet anymore um those seeds are going to look like Swiss chard. Um, and so it will be really obvious when a farmer gets that seed and plants it and says, wait, this isn't, these aren't beets, there's some Swiss chard in my field. And so in that case, they require three miles when they go to the county extension, they say, if I'm growing red beets here, you gotta be three miles away from me if you're growing Swiss chard. But if you're growing another variety of red beets, well, if a red beet crosses with a red beet, it'll probably still just look like a red beet, even if they're different varieties. And so then it's just a mile apart. Yeah. What about tomatoes? I put all my tomatoes together. Yeah, so Is tomatoes. I got no, well, see, tomatoes are an interesting one. I, they, they're over here, um, you know, you know, this says somewhere around 20 feet between different varieties. Of, with tomatoes, what we find is there's two, some tomatoes are very, very self-pollinating. They really won't cross at all. And other ones are more cross-pollinating. So um, the, the couple of ways you can tell um, and it's not cut and dry, but a couple of ways that you can tell is typically ones that have leaves that look more like potato leaves um, rather than tomato leaves. Those ones tend to cross more. And the second way is ones that are fasciated, meaning that like a um, like a brandy wine or something like that that's got lots and lots, you know, that's not just a perfectly round tomato. Those ones also tend to cross more. And so if, if you don't want those types to cross with each other, then you want to separate it a little more you know, in this 20 plus feet range. If it's, if it's, if you're just growing things that are more like modern, you know, you know, beef steaks or cherries, um, you can put them pretty close to each other. And as long as the flowers aren't really touching, you're probably not going to see too many crosses. Well, there's, there's a trick there too, of yeah. just taking your seed from one tomato as opposed to taking your seed from a bucket of tomatoes. You know, because each each flower produces a tomato, and if it's you know liable, it, it's not likely to be crossed. But if you get from a whole bunch of different tomatoes, you're liable to get crossed. Yeah, yeah. So that's the trick with tomatoes. I mean, by and large, yeah. I mean, the things. What I would say is things on this end of the spectrum are going to be ones that are easier seed crops as well for when you're starting out because. You can grow lots of different varieties and you don't have to worry as much about your neighbors, um, what they're growing. And the other reason is because um, the other thing that this spectrum affects is what I was talking about, which is the population size, which is how many plants do you need to save seed from in order for that variety to stay healthy in the long run. And what we find is that um, these cross-pollinating crops often require you to save seed from a lot of plants in order for them to stay healthy. Cross-pollinated crops, I mean, humans are essentially, we're essentially cross-pollinating. Like we, we're kind of dioecious, right? There's males and there's females. We need to cross, make new humans. And we all know what happens when humans inbreed too much, when there's, you know, whatever, a tiny little village in Romania where there's only, you know, a couple of families there and they all marry each other you know, people get deformities and get smaller and weaker. Same thing happens with these highly cross-pollinating plants. If you just are saving seed from 10 corn plants, generation after generation, the corn will get smaller, the plants will get smaller, they'll get weaker, and you'll get what was known as inbreeding depression. They'll get 
um, basically over time deterioration. Over here, these inbreeding plants are not like humans at all. They actually can tolerate they're, they're, they're actually naturally self-pollinate. They naturally inbreed, and they can, they've evolved over time to tolerate that. And so you can save seed from just a couple of plants. You can save seed. This says five plants. And the reason that it says five is because it's usually good, um, even though you can actually save seed from a single plant of a lot of these, and it will not have any inbreeding depression, it's good to have some diversity because sometimes, you know, by preserving genetic diversity in the variety, you know, some years there might be some particular pest or you know, cold weather, hot weather, something like that, where having a, a little bit of a range of genetic diversity helps you so that everything doesn't all fail together. And so within these, it's good to save seed from as many plants as you can, but you can save seed from, you know, in the case of something like peas or lettuce or beans or tomatoes, or even you know peppers, you can just save it from you know a couple of plants. Yeah. So dry beans like speckled bales, do they fall on the beans? Yeah. So most most common beans fall on this, you know, are, are way over here. Yep. So you can save seed from just the, you know a plant or a couple of plants. So that's a good you know reason again why these more inbreeding, more self-pollinating plants are easier to start with. You know. Um, you know, as you get up here, you know, something like brass, because it becomes really hard as a gardener, and I, I feel bad even saying it, you know, it becomes really hard as a gardener to save seed from, you know, 60 cabbage plants, right? So how do you even do that? Well, a couple of strategies can include, um, you can kind of have a buddy system where some, someone else is growing the same variety as you, and you share your seed together at the end of the season. Um, you know, so if you get four people that it can each grow 15 plants, it starts to become a little more doable. Um, but, and there are some brassicas actually, uh, for example, um, the, the red Russian kale um, is uh, as brassica napus. Um, it's different than like the lacinato kales or the green frilly kales, um, which are brassica oleracea. But the brassica napus, the red Russian or white Russian um, kales, can tolerate, they, they can tolerate inbreeding. You can save seed from just um, a couple of plants of it. So that's, there are a couple of exceptions there. So all of this uh, is explored much more thoroughly um, in a nice chart in that seed saving guide that I mentioned that you can take a peek at at OSA's table and you can download for free from our website. So let's think a little bit about how you grow seed. I mean, by and large, growing seed is going to be really similar if you're used to growing vegetable crops. If you grow grain, well, it's growing grain is growing seed. And so that's, you know, a very straightforward transition. But if you're growing vegetables, there's a lot of similarities. Um, if you know how to, you know, if you're a good gardener already, you're, you know, nine tenths of the way there to being growing seed. But there are some important differences. One is timing, of course. Seed growing takes much longer. Um, so you need to plan ahead. You might be able to plant lettuce lots of times a year, but if you're wanting to save seed from it, maybe only some of your earliest planting windows are going to be the ones that you can do if you want to have it fully mature to, to set seed. Spacing. Seed crops require more space. They, you know, again, picking on lettuce, you know, you know, lettuce, you might be able to plant it, you know, 12 inch, you know, on center spacing, so really packed in the garden, but, you know, when those um, uh, plants become you know, full on growing seed, they're going to get this big. And so you need to make more space for them. A lot of times if you're on a garden scale, one thing you can do is you just sort of, you sort of get rid, you start eating the uglies, you know, the ones that, that, you know, if you're like, oh, I really like how that plant looks, that one's going to go for seed, leave that one, but eat the other ones around it. And so it can have more space to grow. So you can still plant it densely, just like you're planting it for a garden, but then eat some of the other, you know, the, the ones you don't like in order to make space for things to be able to make seed. Um, irrigation, the real key with this one is just that once, in, in pretty much, in almost all cases, once these plants are beginning to flower, you really don't want to have any overhead water on them. That encourages disease, it decreases your seed quality, so you want to either, you know, be watering at the base somehow with like drip irrigation like this, um, in a way that is not getting the tops of these wet once it's beginning to flower. Um, weed and pests, um, the main thing here is just like that, 
because these crops go for so long, you need to kind of keep up on your weeding throughout the season. If you just sort of, you know, like with something like lettuce, you know, again, you know, something that's really short, you know, lettuce or spinach or something like that, where you kind of, you know, can, you know, weed your, weed your garden, you know, plant the stuff, maybe weed it one more time. And then if the weeds are growing, no big deal, because I'm going to harvest this stuff pretty soon anyways. In this case, you got to kind of keep up because if you just let it go, the weeds are going to get taller than your plants. It's going to turn into a huge mess. It's going to be more um, green matter in there to encourage disease, and it's going to be really hard to harvest um, once it's time to harvest. So how do you know when to harvest? Um, every crop's a little different, but some of the tricks are basically going to be to look. Often there's some sort of, in the case of um, a lot of, dry seeded crops, seeds that, you know, crops where the, where the seed sort of dries down on the plant and the seed capsules um, start to dry, you'll see there's some sort of color change. Things begin to um, senesce, you know, they begin to become yellow and beige and brown um, and you can start to see that color change. Um, if you open up the pods of the crop, you can begin to see the seeds will change color too often. Um, they may go from, you know, some brighter colors to duller colors or darker. Um, if you actually take the seeds themselves, a really good way to check is, you know, the seeds will go, as they become mature on the plant, they'll go from being more watery and milky, you know, to becoming more, you know, starchy and crunchy and hard on the plants. Um, nature provides some good clues. Often, you know, once the seeds are actually dropping from the plant, when the plants are beginning to drop seeds, well, then you know it's, they're ready, you know, and they're probably a little, maybe past when ideal, but at least you know they're, they're fully mature. Finches and other um, seed-eating birds really have a good idea of when things are mature, and they'll start attacking your plants when they're mature. So you start seeing, you know, birds working your your seeds. Well, then it's definitely time to harvest. Um, so how do you harvest? Lots of different ways you can do it. You know, you can you know some plants can do kind of repeated harvesting, like something like a lot of plants don't mature all their seed at once, and so you have to make a call where. You, either, you can either sometimes leave the, the plants in the ground and maybe bend them over a bucket a little and bang them into the bucket and the ones that shatter and fall out into the bucket are, well those seeds are totally mature and good to go. Um, or you can go ahead and cut the plants you know, down at the base um, and lay them. Um, anyone, anyone here use Remay like floating row cover to protect their plants? Um, um, you, know, you can lay them on something like that. Um, to sort of fully ma finish maturing and drying. If you do lay it on anything, be really careful if you're laying plants, first of all, to you know plants that you've pulled up or cut at the base. Be really careful if you're laying them on plastic like a tarp because what can happen is that plastic, there can be condensation that forms between the plants and the tarp and that can turn into mold really easily. So if you do, I'd almost encourage you just to lay them on the ground rather than on a tarp. If you do put them on a tarp, just make sure you're really turning stuff a lot. Um, so you can lay stuff, you can cut stuff and sort of lay it and let it finish up. You can cut stuff and, you know, hang it upside down inside to let, you know, some of those um, uh, seeds that are a little slower to mature, mature. Um, you know, you can harvest individual seed heads um, as they mature. And then, um, like I was kind of mentioning, you know, you a lot of times it doesn't hurt once you've harvested, if you're harvesting whole plants, just let them dry a little more. This helps the seed mature more on the plant where it's pulling in that last little bit of energy from the plants. And it also helps it, makes your life a little easier because the crispier and drier these plants are, the easier they're gonna be to thresh, um, which is the next thing. And threshing is basically just separating, somehow breaking the seeds apart from the, the plants. So you can do that lots of different ways. You can just do it by hand, by rubbing the seed pods and plants in your hand. You can rub them over screens. Um, you can put it in a pile and just like do a little dance on them. Put them in a pillowcase and jump on them or beat them um, You know, on a um, larger scale. There's lots of equipment that people use, but this, is, this isn't necessarily cleaning. You're just trying to break the seeds off of the plants. Once they're broken, um, I'll just jump to the, the dry seed and then we'll walk back to one seed. Once they're broken, you do, there's basically two easy ways to clean seeds. First is what we call winnowing or fanning. These box fans are great. Um, a box fan, a couple of these Rubbermaid totes, you pour the seed in the top, and what will happen is the seed is heavier than the, the chaff, the non-seed material. 
The seed will fall down, the chaff will blow off. And then I found that not going after the very every single seed is is a good idea. It's better to go after the first ones that hit the best, the best seed because Mother Nature makes a lot of extra seed and the light ones aren't as good seeds. So it's hard for people, but you're better off to toss that seed and save your best seed. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. First off, it'll take you a lot more time if you're worried about saving every seed and that you won't be able to get your seed as clean. Um, and also, you really do just want your heaviest seed. That's going to be like all the way back to that old slide. That's going to be the stuff that's going to be the plumpest, the healthiest, the most likely to pop out of the ground for you when you plant it again. So this process, you're just pouring seed, your, your seed and chaff over the fans, everything light seed and the chaff, the non-seed stuff is falling away and seed is falling in here. It's not going to be perfect. You're going to probably have to do this a few times and you might have to alternate it with screening, which is essentially you use screens. Um, it could be as simple as hardware cloth and window screens from the store, or you can order special seed cleaning screens. And you can either have screens that let your seed fall through and hold the chaff, the non-seed material on top of the screen, or screens that are small enough that the seed stays on top and dust and stuff falls through. So pour it over the screen, give a little shake or a rub on top, and you can separate out, you know, based on the size of your seed, you can you find the right screen that, you know, either lets your seed fall through or keeps your seed on top. Yeah. I'm just wondering, what's the problem with having chaff in your seed? Oh, and then that's the other thing. Um, a lot of times if you're, if you're planting by hand, um, you can just leave your seed, you know, somewhat dirty. And the biggest trick with that is if you are leaving it dirty, you have to be more careful during storage. So, um, all of that seed, you know, super dense and it won't absorb moisture nearly as rapidly as all that fluffy plant material will. And so in, you know, a moist climate like this, you know, if you've got your seed good and dry because you harvested it, you know, on a sunny day and it's all nice and crunchy and dry and you put it in there with a bunch of, you know, stems and, you know, dried leaves and stuff and then you leave it in your, you know, garage, well, all of a sudden all that stuff will turn into a sponge, soak up moisture from the air and it can rot your seeds. So if you do leave your seeds dirty, what I would say is you need to be extra careful about things during storage. Um, so you wanna make sure that you've got your seeds really dry. You might wanna put it in a sealed, something sealed, or put it in with like, you know, use a lot of desiccant or something like that to keep it dry. Do you want number two seed hangs onto your chaff. Right. Your number two seed hangs onto your chaff and your best seed breaks free from it. There's so it's another better reason. not to just get rid of your chaff and just plant your best seeds. Yeah, that's a hard one. People don't like to throw seeds away, but it's yeah. really important. We usually do it with the cover crop. It's only way to do it. Yeah, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you can definitely you can definitely leave things. Yeah, if if you don't clean it, you have to be more careful about when you store things. You want it to be is cool. You want it to be cool and dry, constant temperatures. Um, and you want to kind of monitor it throughout the throughout the, the season and see if it's still staying dry enough. One easy trick is if you throw in with whatever container you're storing your seed, if you stick a like a envelope, some sort of lick to seal envelope in with your seed, if the envelope starts to lose its crispiness, like if it's no longer, you know, makes a nice kind of crackly, crispy paper sound when it when you fold it. Um, then it's starting to get too moist if the envelope sticks to itself. That's really bad. Then it's definitely too moist if it managed to seal itself. And then you should take it out and figure out some way to dry it um, before you put it back in storage. Um, I'll say this real quick, um, and I want to make sure and get to the next presenter. But you want also so that's for dry seeded crops. For wet seeded crops, things like tomatoes, cucumbers. Um, um, particular, um, also the winter squash, because I know there's some tomato savers. Um, the way that you might clean to do tomatoes, for example, is first harvest your fruits when they're super ripe or even a little bit over what you would be harvesting for, you know, to eat them. Smash them. Um, well, if you want to save the fruit to eat, you can cut them in half and just squeeze out the insides, but squeeze out both the seed and the pulp. Put it in a bucket and let it ferment. So you know how tomato seeds have that kind of uh, little um, gel around them? This fermentation process will dissolve that gel um, and get you 
slightly better germ and less disease. Um, so leave it in a bucket and in a warm place. Stir it for um, a couple times a day and let it ferment typically for you know two, three days if it's warm enough. Um, you'll start to see it bubbling up and you can check and see that that gel is dissolved. At that point, the easiest way to clean it is what's called rinsing and decanting. So just add water to your bucket, um, give a little swirl, let it settle, and what happens is the seed, good, your good seed will be at the bottom of your bucket and a lot of your not as good seed and pulp will be you know, throughout the bucket and at the top, and then you just decant, so you just pour it off. You just keep pouring your bucket until you start to see you know, the seed creeping up to the edge of your bucket, and then you stop, add more water, Swirl it around again, let it settle for a second for, so the seeds, you know, the good seeds settle out at the bottom, pour off again, and just keep repeating that process until all you have is, you know, seeds and, and clean water. And then at that point, you can pour it into a screen. These seeds are now wet and they're ready to germinate, and so what you need to do is really quickly get them somewhere um, where they can dry, spread them on a really thin, you know, spread them out really thinly on a screen and let and get them dry and as you're drying them you know give them a stir so that way there's no clumps that um, are holding moisture and sticking together so that's the way to do the wet seeds i'll be um, around if people have more questions and like i said um, you can check out all the information we have at our table um, and and, uh, and check out our website for a lot more information on seed saving All right, Mark. Do you want? Uh, how's it going? Good. How are you? Really good. What's it take to get you out to 